Well, this lecture has a strange name. It's titled, A Stone to Rest Your Head. And uh, it's not a rock, it's a stone. But uh, Peter had a relationship with Jesus, and Peter recognized that Jesus was the rock of all ages. He was the ultimate stone on this planet. And so we need to recognize that we need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, this lecture starts with an interesting prophecy. And we've dealt with this prophecy to some extent. Although, of course, we didn't deal with the book of Daniel. We actually dealt with the book of Revelation. But since the book of Revelation is steeped in the book of Daniel and takes its symbolism from the book of Daniel, we have to jump back and forth somewhat. There's this amazing prophecy in the book of Daniel that we've touched on before, the prophecy of the 2,300 days. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 8, 14. Now the full extent of this prophecy is one that is incredibly important in the world. And as you will know, that the 70 weeks portion of that property, of that prophecy, has actually been cursed by uh, rabbinical societies because it points to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ, as the only one. Actually, the prophecy starts from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And that decree went out when Artaxerxes made that decree in 457 BC. And then it gives the exact time periods of the restoration of Israel and it gives the exact time period as to when the Messiah, the Prince, would come and also the week of his sacrificial death. All of those are included in this fantastic prophecy. And there's a portion of the prophecy cut off for the Jews, but the prophecy continues for 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now if you take 2,300 day years, then you get to a date 1844, with which we cannot do much unless we understand some of the principles involved. But there's a whole lecture coming, which is called 1844 and the final onslaught. We'll be dealing with more of those issues in that lecture. So the cleansing of the sanctuary, what did this entail, and what has this got to do with the study that we're dealing with tonight? Well, Daniel chapter 8 verse 17 tells us a little bit of, about this. So he came near where I stood, and when he came I was afraid and fell upon my face, and he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. So this vision that Daniel got didn't concern his time. This is the 2,300 evening, morning portion of the prophecy. Didn't concern his time, it concerned the time of the end. Not the end of time, the time of the end. So when does this time of the end start? And what does this prophecy tell us? Daniel 8 verse 26 and the vision of the evening and mornings, that's the 2,300 day prophecy, which was told is true. Wherefore shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. So this vision of the 2,300 evening mornings is shut up. It is a sealed vision. It is a closed vision, not to be understood until the time of the end. For at the time of the end shall be the vision. So the decree to rebuild Jerusalem, as I said, went out in 457 BC. There were actually three decrees, but only one decree meant complete political freedom as well as the reconstruction of Jerusalem. All the other decrees had only been there for the temple. So this is the only one that we could take. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, what is the sanctuary that shall be cleansed? Daniel 8, 14. 
The 2300 year prophecy, there was a time period which was called the 70 week prophecy, 70 times 7 days, 490 days, 490 years. If we start with 457 BC, that ends in 34 AD. And it's divided up into weeks. It's a fantastic prophecy. And it tells us that in the middle of the last week, he, Messiah, shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. The sacrificial system will come to an end. And the sacrificial system, of course, was a type of his own sacrifice. So when Jesus dies, that sacrifice, that sacrificial system, comes to an end. It is no longer necessary. It just served as a type for what was going to come. Well, 34 AD, what happened in 34 AD? In 34 AD, Stephen was stoned. And the gospel went to the Gentiles. In fact, Jesus had said to the disciples, Go ye first to the lost children of Israel. So even after the crucifixion, there was work done amongst the Jews. But then in 34 AD... Paul was called, and he was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter had a vision at that time where he was taken to Cornelius, who was a non-Jew, and he was very reluctant to go, but God gave him a vision of unclean animals in a sheet coming down, and Peter interprets this vision in front of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and says to him, God has shown me that I may not call any man unclean. So the gospel now went to the Gentiles. But this vision continues and it ends, if you add it all together, in 1844. Now the proof of the pudding is in the eating and the fact that the first part of the prophecy is fulfilled to the letter tells us that this last part of the prophecy must be more than interesting to us. But Daniel didn't understand the vision, and he was told that it was sealed unto the time of the end. Now, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary, took place at the end of the Jewish year. It was a day of judgment symbolizing the final judgment. Today they call it Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur symbolized this cleansing. Now we'll be dealing with this in greater detail. The high priest went into the Most Holy. The high priest then, when he came out of the Most Holy, made atonement for the entire sanctuary, cleansing it of the recorded iniquities. That means all sin that was recorded was in type removed from the sanctuary. So in other words, even the record of sin was removed. That means that redeemed, the redeemed will stand before God one day as though they had never sinned. There will not even be a record of their sin. So complete is the redemption in Christ. So since 1844, if this is a cleansing of the sanctuary, in an antitypical sense, we have been living in what the Bible calls God's judgment hour. And since 1844, there have been some thunderous events on this planet which really need to be talked about. Now, when was this vision to be unsealed? Daniel 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up. Now, we've already seen this in the lecture yesterday the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So right at the end of time there will come a very troublous time. To that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So sometime after this event, this planet as we know it will come to an end, and something will take its place. There will be deliverance. Daniel 12, verse 4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. 
Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Obviously, the main knowledge here is knowledge about the Word of God shall increase here in the time of the end to make all these things understandable. In a, another sense, knowledge also, of course, increased in a literal sense. Daniel 12, verse 7 and 9, It shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Now, that you should recognize by now from the many times that we've dealt with it. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things will be finished. Okay. Fascinating. What does this tell us? Well, the whole of Daniel, the chapter deals with the battle between good and evil. And here was to be this Antichrist system. In Daniel chapter 7, we have all the details of that. That arises. And for 1,260 years, or 1,260 prophetic days, or 42 prophetic months, or three and a half prophetic years, this system will scatter the saints. This is a reference to the period where the Roman system controlled the religious sphere on this planet and persecuted God's people and scattered them. So for a time, times and half a time, when he, man of sin, shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, which is exactly what he did, all these things will be finished. So when is this time of the end? When does it arise? Sometime after 1798, because this power did this from 538 AD to 1798 when Berthier sealed off the system and called it quits and said, this system has now come to an end. The papal power was restricted. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So, the time of the end starts after 1798. Now, when we did the book of Revelation, we actually came up to this fantastic chapter, chapter 11, where something arises out of the bottomless pit. Can you remember what that was? A beast arises out of the bottomless pit. The same time period is mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, as the time when the kingdom of darkness will start to be manifested here on this planet. So, at this critical time, after 1798, when the beast arises out of the bottomless pit, and the first thing it does, it makes war against the two olive branches. Do you remember that? The word of God. And we had two whole lectures on how the Word of God was attacked and how it has been manipulated by this very power. Now, do you think God would leave the world untouched to allow this kingdom of darkness to spread its numerous errors without a counter? Do you think it would just be able to do that? Because this kingdom of darkness is going to encompass the entire world. This kingdom of God, darkness is going to control the entire world. The Bible says that all the world wanders after the beast. Everybody bows down to him. In Revelation chapter 17, the woman rides the beast and she has on her forehead mystery, Babylon, that great prostitute who makes all the people drink of the wrath of this wine of her fornication. So go your way, Daniel. The words are closed and sealed till the time of the end. Obviously, the time of the end begins after the time, times, and half a time. So sometime around 1798, something must happen to counteract this system. Matthew 24, 21, and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not was since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. 
This is actually a reference here in Matthew 24 to that 1260 day period, which was to be this terrible tribulation period, which will be followed later by a time of great trouble, which is the worst that will ever have been on this planet. But this time period is very prominent. This 1260 day period is repeated seven times in the book of Revelation as a period of great nightmare. But God shortened the time of darkness. How did he do it? Do you remember what he did to shorten the time of darkness? He brought about the Reformation. So instead of this darkness having total control for 1,260 years, the Reformation cut the time short and spread light. But this system was determined to conquer the Reformation. And we saw how it went all out to do that. If God had not done that, if he had not brought about the Reformation, then everything would have been over already. Nobody would be saved because then all light on this planet would have been extinguished. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. W.E.H. Lecky, History and Rise of Rationalism in Europe, says, The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that ever existed. It is impossible to form a complete conception of the multitude of her victims. And this is just a sad fact. And it would have wiped out all vestiges of truth if God had not done something. These are the great monuments of the reformers. Many of them died at the stake. But they were determined to speak the word of God and to make the word of God available to all people. Then Mark chapter 13 verse 24 says, After those days, or in those days, after that tribulation, this period that is mentioned seven times in the Bible, in this period after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. There will be celestial signs. Mark 13 verse 24. Now who would those celestial signs be for? For those who do not know the Bible or for those who do know the Bible? Obviously for those who do know the Bible. But they had been scattered. They had been scattered. The Bible says in Daniel, when he, this Antichrist system, will have succeeded to scatter the power of the holy people. Where did they scatter to? Where did the Reformation scatter to? Where was it? It was in the New World. It had escaped. And the bulk of it, the bastion of, of the Protestant world, had come to this continent that I'm standing on right now. It had come to North America. That's where the bulk were. There were patches in southern Africa. There were patches in the New World, Australia and New Zealand. But the bulk of it, the power, was here. So wouldn't they be the ones to be able to to interpret these signs the best. Mark 13, verse 24. Revelation 6, 12 and 13 says exactly the same thing. And, I, and beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Now remember, we went through the seals and each one of the seals represents a time period in history. And the opening of the seventh seal is the coming of Christ. Every time. The final one, the seventh one, is the culmination of all things, the coming of Christ. So here when he opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake. We have an earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. There was a darkening of the sun. The moon became as blood. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Revelation 6, 12 and 13. Exactly the same that Jesus had said would happen. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Well, was there such a day round about this period, round about the end of the 1,260 days? Yes. There was a great earthquake. One of the strangest earthquakes of all time, the Great Lisbon earthquake. In fact, that was an earthquake that was felt into the southern hemisphere. A very strange earthquake. 
And then the dark day of New England, so familiar to old and young, came May 19, 1780, near 11 o'clock it began to grow dark, as if night were coming, men ceased their work, the lowing cattle came to the barns, the bleating sheep huddled by the fences, the wild birds screamed and flew to their nests, the fowls went to their roost, at night it was so inky dark that a person could not see his hand when held up, nor even a white sheet of paper. History of Weir, New Hampshire, 1735 to 1888, Boston Public Library. That's a fact. The Independent Chronicle said, during the whole time a sickly, melancholy gloom overcast the face of nature, nor was the darkness of the night less uncommon and terrifying than that of the day. Notwithstanding there was almost a full moon, no object was discernible, but the help of some artificial light, which when seen from the neighboring houses and other places at a distance, appeared through a kind of Egyptian darkness which seemed impervious to the rays. This was a very strange phenomenon. These are historic facts. These are not Christians writing. That's a newspaper. Great and memorable events. The Connecticut le legislature was in session at the time. So great was the darkness that members became terrified and thought the day of judgment had come. A motion was consequently made to adjourn. And then Herschel, the great astronomer, frankly admits, the dark day, May 19, 1780, is one of those wonderful phenomena of nature which will always be read with interest, but which philosophy, science, is at a loss to explain. There was no eclipse. There was no reason why there should have been such an event. But it happened. And that night the moon was blood red, but didn't give off any light. You could see it. It was a full moon, but there was no light. It was as if the sun had been darkened and the moon could not reflect its light. And then the stars of heaven fell to earth, November 13, 1833. So in the right sequence there was an earthquake, then there was a darkening of the sun, the moon became as blood, and now there was this strange event of this massive meteor shower, November 13, 1833, 200,000 meteors an hour, there were so many meteors you could read at night with the light of the meteors. But the interesting fact is that it didn't really happen like it looks over here. The meteors se seemed to come from a central point and spread over the sky, where, whereas normally meteors just fall haphazardly. So there were marvelous celestial signs which were seen by Bible-believing students on this continent. And at that time, a man by the name of William Miller started preaching an interesting message. William Miller, 1782 to 1849. Now remember that this prophecy would be unsealed at the time of the end after the 1260-day prophecy comes to an end, the three and a half years. And he claimed, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And he started working up this prophecy of the 2,300 years, which had not been done before. Nobody had ever done that. And here suddenly comes a man and he does this. And in the book of Daniel it says, this will be understood in the time of the end. And he worked out, well, this prophecy comes to 1844, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What does that mean? And he racked his brain and he didn't know what it meant. And so he figured, well, maybe the earth will be cleansed. Then how would that be interpreted? When will the earth be cleansed? When Christ comes again. So he says, well, maybe in 1844, Christ will come again. But of course, there's another verse which says, nobody knows the day or the hour. But having studied this and found that the first part of the prophecy relevant to Christ is an absolute fulfillment that even piqued the Jewish knowledge and made them give a curse or a decree against the study of that portion of scripture, well then maybe the rest of the prophecy was somehow very relevant, and he started preaching on this issue. Now, 
if he had understood the sanctuary part of it, well then he would, might have related it to the earthly sanctuary which serves as a type in the Bible for the heavenly sanctuary. And so he might have then come to the conclusion that in 1844 there is a shift in emphasis to a time of judgment. In other words, the evil side gets its time to set up a kingdom and this is a, the final judgment period, almost like an anti-typical Yom Kippur, and then at the same time there will be a counter message. So in the 1840s a group of people that called themselves Advent believers, that means they believed that the coming of Christ was imminent and that he would come in 1844 sometime then and when he didn't come they were deeply disappointed. Now who were these Advent believers? They were Christians from every single denomination of Christendom existing at that time. In fact, they incorporated some 200 ministers of religion with large parts of their congregations who were waiting for this coming of Christ. And they were actually mocked. But they based their decision on a study by Miller which sounded very solid, biblically and prophetically. Of course Christ didn't come and there was a great disappointment and this movement sort of dissipated except for a core which continued to study the Bible. Now if God has a church, how can we find it? What do people say? Well, there are over 300 different denominations in North America, they said at this stage. Today there are literally Thousands. Newsweek magazine of 1994 calls the explosion of interest in religion a search for the sacred. So in our time there has been a major search for truth. According to Time magazine, the religious section, new religious groups are exploding. And uh, by the 1990s there were 1,187 faiths and now today, well over 2,000, how do you know who's got the truth? Well, here's a book called Religious Controversy in a friendly correspondence between a religious society of Protestants and a Roman Catholic divine. This is a book written by the Reverend John Milner and he asks an interesting question. And what is that question that he asks? Here it is in his book. There is but one question, which is the true church. If you answer that one question, you solve every question of religious controversy. Now that's a very difficult task. And uh, if you have over 2,000 denominations to choose from, well maybe it's a task that you might as well not even want to venture into. And say, well, let's just give up. I mean, this is pathetic. Which one is right? Now, if you really think about it, should it be that difficult? What should be the standard for Christianity to determine whether somebody is telling the truth in all aspects, yes or no? What should be the standard? The Bible. Okay, so the Bible is the standard. So now let's take the Bible as a standard and we go to denomination X and we ask a couple of questions. What do you teach regarding whatever it is. Let's say baptism. What do you teach regarding baptism? Well, if you come to one denomination, they will say, we believe in infant baptism. Are there denominations like that today? Yes. And some of them will say, we believe in baptism by immersing the infant. There are some groups that do that. Others will say, we believe in baptism by infusion, pouring the water over the head. Others will say, we believe in baptism by sprinkling. And others will say, Baptist for example, we believe in baptism by immersion of adults. Some denominations say, immersion once. Other denominations say, immersion three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And some of these variations 
cons exist in the same sisterhood of churches. For example, in some Calvinistic sisterhood of churches, you have infant baptism and you have adult baptism in the same sisterhood. It's very strange. So, which one is right? Are they all right? Or is it okay? Does it make a difference? What do you do? Well, shouldn't it be a simple matter to go to the Bible and see, well, how was it done in the Bible? And then follow the Bible by the letter, yes or no? Okay. Well, let's take um, communion. How communion was held. What is to be done at communion? What does this one do? What does that one do? What does this one do? Etc., etc. And have a look. What does the Bible teach? And it shouldn't be too difficult to determine, well, that's what the biblical way is. What is the doctrine on, let's say, the Antichrist? Well, the old reformers, they were all one on this issue. They pointed to Rome, every single one of them. Luther said so, Calvin said so, Knox said so, Swingley said so, Hus said so. They all said that. Today they don't. Today they have different doctrines. The one says... We believe in futurism. That is, that the Antichrist will come in the future, sometime in the distant future, when the church has already been raptured. Is there, are there denominations like that? Certainly are. great bulk of them say that. Some of them will say, no, 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 the Antichrist was in the past, he existed in the time of Greece, and he was a Greek king by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Now, Daniel says he comes out of the fourth kingdom, so he couldn't have come out of the third kingdom, so here is a confusion. So now, it gets even more confusing. Sometimes the same denomination teaches both. The same denomination teaches both. That's really confusing. Now, the training of the ministers, for example, teaches that preterism is the way it was, he came out of the past, in the past, in the time of Greece. But the denomination is taught uh, futurism. He comes in the future. Now why is that? Because of the bulk of the opinion, owing to the other movements, is swinging towards futurism, because that's more interesting, you see, then something is still bound to happen. Preterism is boring, because then it's already happened. Do you understand the point? So they teach both. How can you teach both? That he came in the past, but he's coming in the future. Does that make any sense? And so we have all these doctrines. Shouldn't it be a simple matter to go to the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say? And then stick to the Bible. And eventually, somebody will have to give up a pet doctrine somewhere along the line and come back into line with the Bible. Yes or no? Okay. So which one is the true church? Well, my opinion would be the one that sticks to the Bible, 100%. The book of Revelation actually reveals the characteristics of this remnant. And you remember yesterday we talked about this woman in white. I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, Jeremiah 6.2. Say unto Zion, thou art my people, Isaiah 51.16. So the church of God is related to this delicate woman. I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin, virgin to Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. The woman, the church. Remember in Revelation 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared to God, that she should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That is the 1,260 year period, where... Rome was persecuting and scattering the people of God and most of them came to this continent and here found solace in the dry areas. Not many nations and peoples and tongues to persecute her. And after that period, what was to happen? We discussed it last night. Verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto earth, he persecuted the woman. The woman were given two wings, flying to the wilderness, place nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And then, what date have we got there? 1798, after the time, times, and half a time. 
And then the serpent casts out of his mouth water. What's that? Nations. Again, nations. As a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. The earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of the mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And he went to make war with a remnant of her seed. Here's the first attribute, which keep the commandments of God. Second attribute, have the testimony of Jesus. So after the 1,260 days, the dragon goes to make war with a remnant that keeps the commandments and holds to the testimony. So what is a remnant? Obviously a remnant is something that remains. It looks like the original. So if the original was a Bible-believing group, believing in salvation in Christ and Christ alone, then the remnant must have that same appeal, except that it also has this sharp attribute that it keeps the commandments, which some of the previous ones also did. The Valdenses kept all the commandments and were persecuted, for example, on the Sabbath issue. So God's church would arise sometime after 1798 in a land of political and religious freedom. Here is the patience of the saints, Revelation 14, 12. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice it doesn't say faith in Jesus. It says faith of Jesus, which is much more than faith in Jesus. It means having the same trust and reliance in Jesus as Jesus had in his Father. That's what it means. It means a very strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Revelation 22, 14. This implies that the commandments are going to become a test in the last days. And that it will make a distinction between those who follow God and those who don't. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will be saved because you keep the commandments. It simply means that there will be this distinction. So blessed are those that do his commandments, not just say, but actually do his commandments, that they may have the right to enter in. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 verse 15. You know, John chapter 14 is a fantastic chapter. It starts off with, let not your hearts be troubled. Doesn't it do that? It says, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And then it says, I will come again to take you to be where I am also. That's the blessed hope, the coming and the return of Jesus Christ. And then in the same chapter it says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. Those are the two attributes which are central to faith in Christ. Obedience to him shows that you acknowledge him as your king. And the fact that he's coming again must be your hope, the blessed hope, Paul calls it. So, obedience and waiting for the coming of Christ. So the two distinguishing characteristics of God's remnant church are it keeps the commandments of God. Does that make any sense? Is that correct? Is that biblical? Number two, it has the testimony of Jesus. We don't know what that is yet, but it has it, right? Whatever that is, it has that. So question, what is the testimony of Jesus? Well, let's ask the Bible. Now, John is in vision and an angel comes to him and informs him and he falls at the feet of this angel to worship him. And this angel says to him, See that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. So you cannot worship an angel. So here we have, have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You have the definition. Okay, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What does that mean? Well, it's such a big concept that we'll deal with it in a whole lecture. We'll do it tonight. Revelation 19, 
verse 10. So that's an attribute we'll have to discuss in some detail. So God's last day church would keep the commandments and have the gift of prophecy. When Jesus ascended to heaven to stabilize his church, the Bible says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, teachers. Ephesians 4.11 If this was what the church needed in the beginning of its ministry, surely it will need it at the end of its ministry as well. Doesn't that make sense? Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 6, 7. All the gifts must be there. So the Bible predicts the gift of prophecy will be restored to God's church in the last days. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. Amos 3, verse 7. So what must be restored at the end of time? The fullness of the gospel. Surely there must be someone who will take the whole Bible and say, our life must be dictated to by what it says in the Word of God and not anything else. So if Wycliffe discovered the authority of the Bible and Hus discovered obedience to God and Luther discovered salvation by grace and Calvin discovered freedom of conscience, and Williams discovered baptism by immersion, all of which are biblical, and Wesley discovered lordship of Christ, then Miller discovered again the hope of the second coming, which is the hope of the church. And Miller also discovered prophecy as an important guideline. Can prophecy save me? Yes or no? No. I can know everything about prophecy and it won't do one thing to save me. But what can prophecy do? It can tell me where I am in the stream of time. And prophecy can show me that the Bible is trustworthy. If you take the prophecies in the Bible, whew, the prophecy of Tyre, for example, fulfilled to the letter, to the letter, including sweeping it off, the face of the earth and dumping the whole city into the sea, including its dust. That's a tough prophecy to fulfill. Make no mistake. Somebody said to you today, Vancouver will be swept off the land, dumped into the sea, and even the dust will be used and thrown into the ocean. You would say, well, this man is slightly mashuga, right? He has lost it. But that prophecy was fulfilled to the letter. All prophecy will be fulfilled to the letter. And then there must be a final restoration under the guidance of the spirit of prophecy which encompasses all truth. Isn't, wouldn't that be logical? That would be a logical thing. But what if this organization or this truth comes into contact with all the others that will not move further than their founders and then unfortunately have a clash with all of them? All of them. Now Revelation chapter 10 is this marvelous chapter culminating here within this sixth trumpet where you have this one power meeting the power that comes out of the bottomless pit. So out of the bottomless pit comes a power that is to take over the whole earth and at the same time something else arises that is to counteract that power. Let's see. Revelation chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face were as it were the sun. Ezekiel had a similar vision. Daniel had a similar vision. This is a prophecy that deals with something important because Christ himself is going to tell us what it's all about. So let us study Revelation chapter 10 and see where it brings us. In Revelation chapter 10, as we have seen, this mighty angel with a rainbow upon his head, the face like the sun, his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open. 
That's fascinating. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Seven thunders, the voice of God, if you like, over all seasons. And he had in his hand a book, and a sealed. Interesting. Where in the Bible do we read about a sealed scroll? Daniel. In fact, Daniel's 2,300 evening morning prophecy is the only prophecy in the whole of the Bible that's sealed. And it's sealed unto when? The time of the end. Now as we were studying the book of Revelation, every time we come to this sixth period, then we go into the time period after 1798. Isn't that interesting? That's exactly the right time period. And the French Revolution, Revelation chapter 11, the power that comes from the bottomless pit that makes war against God's word and against God's truth. All of these issues happen around that date. Here's a counter. God says, here's a scroll in my hand. Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and the earth lifted up his hand to heaven to swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things therein in are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which therein are. What is that? That's the seal of God. That's the seal of God. He created heavens, the things that they are in, the earth, the things that are therein, the sea, the things that are therein, and where do we find that portion of Scripture in the Old Testament? In which commandment? In the fourth commandment. Which gives validity to the whole law because it was the seal of his authority. I make this law because I am the creator of heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is. So the seal of God appears here and there should be time no longer. What time? Either it's the end of time, as some interpret it, or it means no more prophetic time. What was the longest time prophecy in the Bible? The 2,300 evening morning ones? And this time period was now coming to an end, and here was a book, and it was open. Obviously it had been closed and sealed, what is going to happen to this scroll now? The 2,300 evening morning ones is the only one that was sealed. What's going to happen to it? Well, he says to the prophet, go and take the little book which is now open, which is open in the hand of the angel. Take it and eat it up. Okay. What does that mean? Internalize it. Put it inside you. And it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. Question, what comes first when you eat something, the mouth or the stomach? The mouth comes first and then comes the stomach. So when he is internalizing the scroll, which is the word of God, whoo, sweet. And then, bleh, bitter. All right? And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth as sweet as honey, just as he had said. And as soon as I had eaten it, digested it, as it were, internalized it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Whoa, that's interesting. So this new commission over here is a worldwide commission. Many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, a worldwide commission. Now, why prophesy again? Is it possible that once you have eaten this book, once you have internalized the prophecy, that you might think, wow, this is sweet news. Something's going to happen that will end all trouble here on earth. And then it doesn't happen, and you find you have to drudge on. You have to do it again. That's interesting. And then still to many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Well, let's have a look here. Jeremiah 15 verse 16. Thy words were found and I did eat them. 
And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. So, eating the word of God can bring joy. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll. This is not a bread roll, by the way. This is a scroll, a book, that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said unto me, Son of man, go get thee into the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. Does everybody understand now what it means to eat the word of God? It means to internalize it, understand it, and then go and preach it. Now Ezekiel got the commission to preach to Israel alone. This previous commission was to preach to whom? All the nations, the peoples, the languages, and the tongues. That was the previous commission. So here was an internal commission. A scroll was to be understood and it was to be preached. Okay. Now, remember in 1844, around about that date, Miller had preached, it seems to me that the 2300 day prophecy, exactly the right time, he starts studying a book that had been sealed and now this book is open and the world Christians come together and they study this. Remember that over 200 ministers alone from different denominations studied these prophecies. And they decided, wow, maybe it means Jesus is coming again. That's a sweet message. Maybe we don't ever have to worry about anything. They prepared themselves for the coming of the Lord. It didn't come. And it turned to bitterness in their stomach. And many of them disappeared. Only a core remained and said, something's wrong. We misunderstood something. We missed something. There must have been a finger over this part of the prophecy that we didn't understand. Now, is this fair of God or is this unfair of God? Well, did he perhaps deal like this in the past as well, for a particular reason? And the answer is, yes. Revelation 10, 11, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Do you remember when the Jews had crucified Jesus, what was the state of the apostles and the followers of Christ? They were dejected, destroyed. Why? Because they had believed Jesus would never be crucified. He will announce himself as the Messiah and the kingdom would come. That's a sweet message. And it turned to bitterness and grief. And here are two men walking on their way to Emmaus, their feet dragging along. They were so dejected, so miserable. Why? Because their sweet expectation had turned to bitterness. And then a third one came in amongst them and said to them, let me explain to you the scriptures. And starting from where? From the beginning. He explained to them all the prophecies concerning himself. Isn't that wonderful? And what happened after they suddenly clicked? What happened? Wow! There he was. He came into their home. He broke bread and they recognized him. And they took off like greased lightning and ran all the way back to Jerusalem. Away was the lethargy, there was spring in the step, and they raced back with a tremendous message. Isn't that correct? And suddenly the scriptures were open to them and they understood the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and the truth crystallized in their hearts and they went off with power. That's what happened then. Why was this great tribulation, if you like, this great bitterness permitted? Well, there were many, many hangers-on that were following Christ for the sake of what? Getting into this new kingdom. That's it. But to give up self? No way. To be ridiculed? No way. Not even Peter could stand the ridicule. The ridicule of a woman that said, you're one of them too. Nah, not me. Remember that? He couldn't stand the ridicule. So what was left was a core that had said, surely we were not deceived. Surely this was the Son of God. Somehow, 
we have missed something somewhere. And only those that were really sincere remained. Now when we did the seven churches, we came to, just before Laodicea, there was a Philadelphia group. And it said you were small in number. Do you remember that? Small in number. And they were full of love. And they were without rebuke. That's the little remnant that remained there that had been cleansed through this great disappointment. And so, 1844 unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Wow! They discovered something. The tremendous sanctuary message, which is the greatest message of all time, the gospel in the Old Testament, explaining the ministry of Christ from A to Z. He's the door. He's the sacrifice. He's the one that washes you, the laver. He's the one that's the light of the world, the menorah. He's the bread of the presence. He is the incense. He is the high priest. We have such a high priest. All these wonderful things suddenly gel. Wow! Now if that earthly sanctuary was cleansed, then the heavenly must be cleansed. That means 1844 doesn't mean Christ is coming. That means we're living in the time of judgment. People must make a decision. There must go a message of judgment and repentance to the world, to every nation, tribe and tongue. You see, the sanctuary is a mini presentation of the plan of salvation, a beautiful message. And it takes a whole lecture to explain that. What must be prophesied again? What is it? What is the message that must go to the world in this time of conflict when Satan is setting up his kingdom? Well, you just read a little bit on because it explains the controversy as it grows. Revelation chapter 11, this dark kingdom is being set up. Revelation 12, the clash between the giants, Christ and his people, Satan and his people, the next chapter, chapter 13, the details, the nuts and bolts of the final attack, the beast out of the sea, the old system of church and state working together, the beast out of the earth, the new system of church and state working together against God's people, the implementation of the mark of the beast, all of these great issues. What must be preached to counter that? And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. There's the message that must go out again. Firstly, it's an everlasting gospel, not a half gospel. A half gospel says you are saved by your obedience. That's what the Jews taught. Modern Christianity, you are saved by Jesus, stands on one leg. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to be obedient. The law's been done away with. Do whatever you please. Is the whole of the law. As long as you say, I love Jesus, you're okay. But the everlasting gospel required obedience as well as recognizing that without Christ we are nothing. Everlasting gospel. So it has both components. Saved by the blood of the Lamb, and as a consequence, if you love Him, keep the commandments. That makes sense. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. There we go. Yom Kippur. Worship Him that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. So at the same time, a message goes out into the world, worship the God of evolution. You come from the slime pit. Same time, another message. No, worship him who made the heavens, the earth, and the fountains of water. So the three angels' messages go into the world. The hour of judgment has come. Babylon has fallen. And do not accept the mark of the beast. Now we've dealt with these issues. That's what has to be preached to the entire world. So this organization has to be a worldwide movement. It cannot be a local organization. Matthew 24, 14 also says this, and this gospel of the kingdom, not the kingdom of this earth that is being set up by the United Nations and by Rome, no, 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 the kingdom of God, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. It has to be a universal message, otherwise it doesn't work. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. All power is in Christ, not in some earthly representative of Christ. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11 Not the slime pit of evolution. Jesus Christ gets the honor of being the creator of this universe. Here is the patience of the saints. It's going to be a battle. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. If you keep the Sabbath, what are you saying to the world? I believe that God created the world in six days. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. And therefore the Lord God commanded you to keep holy the Sabbath day. See? There you go. I just have to keep the Sabbath and I'm in the throat of world philosophy. In the throat. Thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro trying to understand the prophecies, but knowledge shall be increased. It will be understood at the end of time. This gift will once again come to a fall. So in the same time period, as God raises up this counter-movement to face the world, you have Freemasonry coming in the world, demoting Jesus Christ, you have spiritualism, teaching there is no death, life continues forever, you have theosophy, which teaches that Lucifer is the true son of God, you have all kinds of false prophets, we've dealt with them, you have the Joseph Smiths, you have the Blavatskys, you have the Alice A. Baileys, and they write hordes of books which are the literature of the great institutions of this world. The United Nations acknowledges this literature as the fountain of its resources. The Mormon movement, the Jehovah's Witnesses, all of these movements. In the Mormon movement, the priesthood is taken away from Christ and given to man, the order of Melchizedek. Jehovah's Witnesses demote Jesus Christ. Christian science movement says we are God and we are eternal. All these movements arise at the same time. And here's this other little movement that must counteract it. And God's message is a message of separation. Revelation 18.4 Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Wherefore come out of among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you, 2 Corinthians 6.17. What is the message of the worldly kingdom? Inclusiveness. Come together. Those who adopt separateness will sooner or later stand exposed. That's what Alice A. Bailey says. And what did Robert Miller say, the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations? If you do not join in, if you have a spirit of separateness, sooner or later you'll come to regret it. Didn't he say that? So we have a clash of ideals. What does it mean to be ecumenical? The word ecumenical is derived from the Greek term oikomene, which may be translated as the whole inhabited world. It is in seeing this world as God's that we see ourselves as one. It is in seeing all the world's people as made in the image of God that we are called to protect the welfare of everyone. So here is a problem. Oikomene, come together, separateness. Priest J. O'Connell, the final object of ecumenism as Catholics conceive it is the unity in the faith, worship, and the acknowledgement of the supreme spiritual authority of the Bishop of Rome. And the other movement says, do not accept the mark of the beast. Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen, separate yourselves, separate yourselves. Wow, here's a recipe for disaster. And the Bible warns us all the world wandered after the beast. They're not going to listen to this message. So only individuals will listen. Behold, he comes with the clouds. Every eye shall see him. Revelation 1.7. A powerful message. Warn the people. Warn the people. Christ is coming again. Oh, Christ is not coming again. We're going to have peace and safety on this planet is the other message. We're going to set up a kingdom here. And 
Rome will rule and everything will be nice as it was in the Middle Ages, dark and miserable. Well, let's have a look at these attributes again. It keeps the commandments of God. Is that biblical? Okay. It has the testimony, which is the spirit of prophecy, which we haven't defined in its fullness yet, but we accept that that's what it must have, because the Bible says so, and the faith of Jesus. Well, you'll have to have faith that Jesus is coming again, and you must have faith that he will save you, just like he said, his father will be there and never leave him nor forsake him. It arose out of a great disappointment. There was a bitterness, a sweetness and a bitterness. It preaches three angels' messages. It has to do that on a worldwide basis. And it therefore has to be a worldwide movement. Look at those points and tell me if you know of a denomination that does that. Is there a denomination that does that? Anyone? Do the Baptists do it? Do the Methodists do it? Do the Congregationalists do it? Do the Charismatics do it? Who does it? Is there anyone out there who does it? Well, there's one. There's one denomination, one alone. And it is a worldwide movement. In fact, there are only two worldwide denominations that call themselves Christian. Can you guess which ones they are? We'll talk about that. This is Germany. There's a young man with a radio satellite. The biggest satellite evangelism in the world today is run by the church that you're sitting in today. The biggest satellite evangelism in the world. This is Germany, institutes in Germany, hospitals. This is also in Germany. This is in Rome, right in the center of Rome. Huge institutions. Other hospitals over there. This is Switzerland. This is England. One of the colleges in England. This is a camp meeting held in England. I was a speaker at this camp meeting. There were a few thousand people there. A tremendous health ministry. St. Helena Hospital, Adventist Hospital, Loma Linda Hospital. This whole town is basically Adventist. Uh, a health ministry in this, in this pharmacy, there are no drugs. Only alternative medicine, health medicine. This is a little health institute up in the mountains in Norway with a little gym, with a little health message. They bake bread, which is not full of chemicals, and they supply the whole of Norway. The whole of Norway is supplied by this bakery with an alternative bread without any strange disodium acetates or whatever noxious compounds there are in it. A press, a school, a farm, organic farming, health farming, getting people back to a healthy lifestyle. Christ always dealt with the physical needs as well as the spiritual needs. And so his people should also take care of the physical needs as well as the spiritual needs. How do you reorganize the soil so that life will come back into the plants? Did you know that the Adventist Church is a leader in this field worldwide? It has a whole organization called ADRA which sets up organizations that teach people to farm, that brings relief and all those types of things so that people can sustain themselves and be healthy. They are in Korea, they are in the darkest parts of Africa. You can go and worship under some trees with them. This is one in Zimbabwe, this is one in Malawi, this is a hospital. If you are in Germany and you are a tourist, you will receive a list of hospitals if you go to Africa, for example. And on that list there will be all the Adventist hospitals. Every tourist in Germany receives a look, can receive a list like this from their tourist agency. Because they'll say, those are the only hospitals we can be pretty sure that you'll be safe. Because they are hygienic and they take care of you. And uh, I'll tell you, the hospitals in Africa, my son's a medical doctor, some of them are absolutely horrendous. You cannot believe the state that they are in. But when you go to the Adventist ones, they're clean, they're nice. Here's a dental faculty, here's another one of the hospitals. There's a theological school. Here's a nice family. I 
love this family. They are so cute. Look how rich they are. Can you see how modern their clothes are and how nice they are? These are really poor people. And that's a little house where they live. And that's the man over there and his wife, his Noel and his wife. What a dedicated man. He goes forth, he has no money. He travels all over the world with nothing. And he preaches a message with such power. I stayed with them, I slept on the floor. They didn't have beds, so we slept on the floor. What a wonderful people they are. Really brothers and sisters. I'm really proud of them. Here I was in Africa preaching in this church. I'll tell you it's a different thing to preach in Africa. It's an amazing thing. This service was to start at 11 o'clock. No, this service was to start at 9 o'clock. There was to be a lecture at 9 o'clock. By 11 o'clock we only arrived at the church. That was a nightmare for me. There was not a soul in the church. And I said, we missed it. We were supposed to be here at 9. He said, no, they're not there yet. <laughs> they started rocking up at about 12. In Africa, things start when everybody's there. That's logical. <laughs> Why worry about time? You see, relationships are very often more important to them than time. For example, while I was traveling with this chap, he suddenly saw an old lady alongside the road carrying a bag. So he pulled the car over. You should have seen this car. This car that it even drove was a miracle. I think it actually drove sideways all the way, but nevertheless. He stops this car, he gets out, and he talks to this little lady. And then he takes her bag, and he <coughs> walks with her for half a mile, takes her upstairs, puts the bag down wherever he is, comes back almost an hour later. By this time, I'm sweating. We're now an hour late for church already. He doesn't say a word. This is now this Noel chap. Off we drive, and suddenly he sees someone else. He stops the car, and I say, oh, what's this man doing? Is he totally nuts? Gets out of the car, talks to this man for about half an hour, gets back into the car, and so we arrive at the church two hours late. And not a soul there. And of course, I'm totally freaked out. And they weren't even there yet. And so eventually he came up to me and he says, I saw you were sweating. I said, yes, why? <laughs> he says, you thought, you know, we Africans, we're strange, right? And he says, you know what, I can explain to you what happens because I happen to think like you. Because I was abandoned as a little child and I was raised by white missionaries. So I have a Western mindset in terms of time. And I had to learn to be like my people again. See, you see, when I saw that little old lady there, when she was standing there, it would have been rude of me to drive past her if she saw me. And I went out and I got to her and I spoke to her, and it would have been rude in my culture if I had said, I see you carrying a big bag here, let me help you quickly. Bye, I'm off, I'm in a hurry. You don't do that in my culture. You say, how are you? And then you go through the whole chronology. How are your kids? How's this one? How's that one? How's that one? How's the next one? And finally you get to the point you need help with that bag, and then you come down and that's it. Now you have fulfilled your commission, and that's more important than time in their culture. Now in, in the German culture, it's exactly the opposite. When you go there, you get a Minutenplan. You know about a Minutenplan? Here. You may do this, and your prayer may be one minute, 45 and a half seconds. Thereafter, a guillotine comes and you're dead. <laughs> now that works well for that culture. Now which one is God's culture? The one or the other? I'll tell you what, both. Both are his culture. And we have to understand the different cultures. So here they were, they just packed the place out and eventually there was no standing room and they were all around the church and they were more outside than inside. So I missed nothing and they stayed till the last lecture was finished. Who cares when that ends? <laughs> so very interesting. This is Halderberg College, beautiful place in Africa and uh, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. For me, this is the only denomination that does all of these things. And of course, it is a denomination that is frowned upon by many and they say, isn't that a sect? Why is it a sect? Because it teaches everything that every denomination teaches 
and even includes those things which the founding fathers included, but refuses to compromise on many of the other issues that seem compromisable. You cannot compromise the word of God. Do you think this is a perfect church? Oh no, this is not a perfect church. Jesus described the perfect church, the last one, Laodicea, remember? What did he say it was like? He said they were blind, pitiful, poor, wretched, and naked. So if you're looking for the perfect church, don't go up to this one. It in fact has to be blind, pitiful, poor, and wretched. That's what it's got to be like. So I didn't join this church because of the people. In fact, if it were for the people, I would still be running. <laughs> Why did I join it? Because of the truth that it teaches. Every single doctrine that it has is biblical. Are there people in the church that fight over the doctrines? Yes. But they are established, they are there, and they are biblical. And as long as those doctrines are biblical, that's fine by me. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. John 10, 16. Not 20 folds, not a hundred folds, not a thousand, not two thousand. One fold, one shepherd, Jesus Christ. The world is uniting under one shepherd, the Pope in Rome. I have no problem if they want to do that, but my Bible says there's one Lord, one King, and that's Jesus Christ. And I will follow him wherever he goes. And the Bible also says that Laodicea is the last thing on this earth, representing God, then comes the coming of Christ. These are serious issues. Does this church live up to the biblical criteria? Does it arise at the right time? Does it preach exactly the, this message that must be preached to the entire world? Yes. But remember one thing. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. If you want to have peace and quietness, then don't ever come here. Because the wrath of the dragon will be an experience that we have. I once started a sermon, how's everybody feeling this morning? Great, something wrong with your religion. Because in this world you will have tribulation. You will have all these problems. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, says Jesus. So don't expect a perfect church. Expect truth. And where there is truth, you have people that love the truth. And you will find them. Where there is truth, there is wrath and there is strife. Because the dragon hates truth. So you will find people that constantly bicker and argue about every aspect. Don't look at the people, look at the truth. And God will be the only one that you can ultimately rely on 100%. So if ever you want to learn to trust and hold on to Jesus Christ, then try following the truth. It is an amazing experience. But as the days of Noah were, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving into marriage. Boy, is this world eating and drinking, isn't it? Everything, their food is their religion. Marrying and giving into marriage. They change relationships like they change shirts and they can change churches like they change shirts. Isn't that right? You choose a church according to the music. Hello, do you choose your wife according to her blouse? Until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 37, 39. We are heading for some troublous times. And we will be surrounded by issues 
They don't make this an easy ministry. And what was the lot of poor old Noah? Everybody said, Noah, great job you're doing there. Building an ark for all of us. Can't wait to get into that boat, right? No, they mocked him. I'm sure he dragged even some of his kids into that ark. Judging by how they acted after the ark landed. So they mocked him and laughed at him. Do you think truth is popular in the world? Yes or no? So don't expect a popular truth. Don't expect a popular message. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Two worldwide movements. I'll let you guess again. Which are the only two movements that are worldwide in the world today? Do you think it's Islam? No, it's not yet worldwide. Which two movements are worldwide? I'll give you the one. Roman Catholicism is a worldwide movement in every nation of the earth. And there's one other little denomination that has that same attribute. That's the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's the only one. It's the only one. The Lutherans are big, but they're only in about 65 countries. That's it. All nations. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Well, physical healing as well as spiritual healing. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn thy, away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, Isaiah 58, 12 and 13. The restorer of the breach, the law, had been breached. That must be restored. The Sabbath must be restored. Two denominations, this is the American Bible Society and church missions. It's very small, I just put it there for reference. Those are all the countries in the world, or all the denominations in the world. These are all the countries in the world, and you'll see X, 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 only along one of them, of the Protestant ones, and that's the Adventists. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1, 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. That's quite an interesting statement by Rome, made in 1969. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and the keeping holy of Saturday, or Catholicity and the keeping of holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. That's what the Roman Catholic Church wrote already in the Catholic Mirror in 1893. Which Protestant denomination keeps Saturday? There were two, three, four, five, six, and slowly they whittled down. Eventually, there is one great opponent to this message. Sunday is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. Except one denomination. You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you will find not a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. Cardinal Gibbons, the faith of our fathers. That's what Rome says. What does Rome say further? The Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church, American quarterly, uh, Catholic quarterly. Sunday, it is the law of the Catholic Church alone. The observance of Sunday by Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. These are all Catholic statements. The Protestant says, how can I receive the teachings of an apostate church? How, we ask, have you managed to receive her teachings all your life in direct opposition to your recognized teacher, the Bible, on the Sabbath question? The Christian Sabbath. The Catholics are pretty direct on this issue. Then they say in Catholic Mirror, those who follow the Bible as their guide, the Israelites, and the Seventh-day Adventists, have the exclusive weight of evidence on their side. While the biblical Protestant has not a word in self-defense for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday, Rome is mocking the Protestant world. And then they say, the Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher who can find no warrant in its pages for the change of day from the seventh to the first. Hence their appellation, Seventh-day Adventists. Rome knows why we're called Seventh-day Adventists. Shouldn't the world? The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath 
to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by our founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestants claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday in this matter. The Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. That's the question box, Catholic Universe Bulletin, 1942. Catholic Church says there's one consistent Protestant left in this world. And who do they finger, is it? Seventh-day Adventists. Now imagine this. Who stands rebuked? Rome stands rebuked because they changed the law of God. And Protestants stand rebuked because they go along with Rome. So both groups are going to be angry with whom? Both groups are going to be angry with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why? Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the very name rebukes them. The very name is irritating. Seventh day, we keep the law of God, we try, stumble and fall by the grace of God, we stumble along, but we say this is the truth and we'll try and live up to it by the grace of God, not saying we're perfect. Number two, Adventists. We wait for the blessed hope. We're not interested in a worldly kingdom. So everybody hates them, and they call them a sect. Well, they called Paul's church a sect. What is sectarian? What is a cult? What is a cult? Cult is someone that has an extra-biblical teaching. What's the biggest extra-biblical teaching in the world? Roman Catholicism is the biggest cult in the whole of this planet. Seventh-day Adventist church, as its official doctrine is, we have no other creed save the Bible. No other creed. Here is St. Catherine's Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21, 1995, the cardinal writing. What does the cardinal write? People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Catholic Church knows what the truth is, but they tell you we won't obey it, you better obey us. Pope launches crusade to save Sunday. Make it clear that Sunday must not be worked since it must be celebrated as the day of our Lord. Seventh-day Adventist church says, sorry, we cannot go along with you. The Bible says something else. And you know it. So no wonder at the 1999 interfaith meeting where all the religions came together, they condemned the Christian fundamentalists who abuse speech and whose efforts at converting others incite hatred and violence. This is not an effort to convert anyone. This is putting the truth out into the world. What you do with it is your business. You have freedom of choice. That's the greatest gift that God has given you. This is truth. Have I ever told you to become anything? No. I'm just telling you this is what the Bible says. This is what they say. This is what the Bible says. This is what they say. Choose. That's all. All present were... In accord on two key points, Pope John Paul II was endorsed by consensus as the planet's chief spiritual guide and overseer. And the religious fundamentalists who refuse to go along with the global ecumenical movement are to be silenced. They must be denounced as dangerous extremists full of hate. I can't do anything about it if he wants to do that. Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the truth, not a half-truth, not lie. The wall of separation between church and state that was erected by secular humanists, God forbid, and other enemies, God forbid even more, of religious freedom has to come down. Those opposing our views are the new fascists. Keith Tunia, Time Magazine, 1995. So the church wants to persecute. In vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, Matthew 15, 9. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the message, plain, simple. Cuts down to the chase, choose Jesus Christ or choose the world. That's your choice. And the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst, come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's your choice. Freedom of choice. What a beautiful point. Choose the world or choose Jesus Christ. Choose obedience to the world, choose obedience to Jesus Christ. That's the choice. Jesus is coming soon and I believe he's going to take his children to heaven and the Bible says keep the commandments of God that you may have a right to enter 
Not because the commandments save you, because they tell you where your allegiance lies. That's the bottom line. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. The choice is yours, and God help you with it. Amen.